Ben, it's exciting to have you on. Um, today we've got uh, Ben Hughes, um, human being extraordinaire. I was going to say singer extraordinaire, but honestly, you're just amazing. Um, ben is one of my close friends here in Manchester, um, and he um, has been on a journey of deconstruction alongside me and, and many of my friends. Um, and he recently just put out an EP, um, which contains quite a few songs that kind of like um, navigate some of that. And so we're, we're, we're going to maybe talk about some of that. We're going to talk about some of Ben's journey and just kind of have a bit of a chat. But Ben, why don't you kind of introduce yourself a little bit and just tell people, I probably did a fairly good job. <laughs> you can fill in the gaps. There's probably a little bit there that doesn't cover exactly the human being that Ben is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, Phil said it. Like I'm kind of a... I'm a singer songwriter, so I um, uh, enjoy writing songs as a hobby. At the moment, it's just a hobby, and I, I, um, I spend most of my time working full time as a structural engineer um, in Manchester. So, yeah, um, it's kind of the two things which take up most of my time at the moment um, designing, building, and writing songs. Um, as Phil said, I sort of um, went through a kind of process of which we'll probably talk about kind of my faith changed a lot over the last few years and the way that I relate to um, sort of, yeah, Christianity has, has shifted in quite a big way. So, um, and, and kind of when I was writing songs in the last couple of years, that's one of the things which basically came out in my songwriting because it was the, the main thing which I had to write about. <laughs> the only thing I kind of knew that was passionate yeah, yeah, yeah. enough to really be motivated to write about. So yeah, kind of, and that's, it's kind of, with almost without, without realising it, kind of, it's kind of, um, I didn't intentionally go out to write an EP that kind of talks about this, but it just kind of naturally happened. Well, mm. more, more so in a few of the songs than others, but yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. I, I think of that, like, and I'm like, there's, there's something about um, your personality, Ben, that is very, um, you're, you're very creative and you're very um, systematic in a lot of ways as well. Um, I am not as creative. I'm definitely very systematic, but I'm not creative. We watched, um, what did we watch the other day? Oh, we watched Rocket Man. Have you seen Rocket Man? Yes, John? great movie. Oh, my I really God. Liked it, yeah. But like, I, so I'm not that into music. I just, I, I don't know why. I just, I'm not that into it. But I, I watch stuff like Rocket Man. We watched, um, what's the um, Freddie Mercury one called? Um, oh, um, Bohemian Rhapsody. Bohemian Rhapsody. We watched the Rhapsody. documentary on, um, on um, Netflix for Taylor Swift. Uh, we watched a documentary oh, yeah. for um, Lady Gaga as well. Both of those oh, yeah, are really that cool. One. I've seen um, that one. I've and I watch, these, I watch these stories of musicians and I see how they create a song and I'm just in awe. Because um, me and my bro, so me and my brother Neil, we used to, when we were kids, we'd like play a song and then like, be like, all right, let's change all the lyrics. And we could do that perfectly. You know, give me a song yeah, yeah. and I can come up with some funny lyrics, kind of Weird Al style or something. Or, uh, like Chris Moyles used to do in the, the UK. We've got a yeah. radio presenter. Does that. But like, I cannot fathom how you sit there and go, well, oh, that's a cool lyric. And then go, oh, this is music that will fit it. I mean, to watch. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a bit of a trick. Like, it's one of those things like, I still don't really know. Like, like the, one of my favourite songwriters is a guy called John Mark McMillan. You might have heard of him. He's kind of like a Christian songwriter, but I think um, he's not like a he's not like a worship leader, you know. Mm. But he does sort of have a faith. But um, I saw he was I, on um, a deconstruction podcast recently. Um, really? Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Like, the deconstructionist podcast, I think it's called. Um, really? And I saw they'd had him on at one point. Um, so I don't know. I don't know much about him. Yeah, but I, think I don't he's know. I, 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 it doesn't on. surprise me from like um, listening to his songs and stuff. It doesn't surprise me that like that's the case. But but I just love him as a songwriter. And, and one of the things he said like um, was that like he's released like a few albums. He's got like if you look at his stuff on Spotify, he's got like 50, 60 songs on there, you know. Oh. And he says he's never um, finishing a song always seems like a miracle. <laughs> Like even though he's done it loads of times, he still gets to the end once the song's finished and recorded, and it's and he feels happy with it, and he still feels like it's uh, like he's still surprised by it. Yeah, know? it's kind of how I feel because it is one of those things where like you sort of start with a little idea, and then um, and then you just gradually build it up. Like some people will write a song in like five minutes, but for me, it's like quite a painful process. Really, yeah, I'll get one idea, and then. I'll just work on that idea until I feel like it comes to a point where I feel, yeah, it's ready now, it's complete. And it can take months, you know, sometimes. 
that's really funny man like it just it just blows my mind it's like i just i can't do that <laughs> so there's quite things that i can do that you know other people can't probably yeah you know, I, I feel the same with people that like write novels and stuff i'm like how the heck yeah. do you go about writing like a novel or you know creating an, a world that's completely in your imagination or yeah. It's just astonishing to see like that kind of creativity um, expressed in different ways of someone just creating nothing, uh, something from yeah, nothing. Um, totally. But yeah, no, that is that's really cool. So how do you start? Do you start with lyrics? Do you have kind of like some words that you're playing with or do you have melodies and songs that you like to do and then you kind of fit words to that? Because I know you can kind of do that both ways. Um, for me, um, it's often that I sort of get like a hook. I call it a hook. Um, it's, it's just like an, an idea, maybe like a one line of lyrics that goes with a melody. Um, uh, and, and then I'll just, I'll just know instinctively, oh, that's, 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 that's something which I can sort of hang my hat on. You know, that's something which I can um, work with. And then, so I have that and I know that's something that I can build on. And then I work around that basically. And often it comes with like, maybe that's like the, the main part of the chorus. And then I'll work around that and try and figure out like a verse to go with it or yeah. um, some chords to go with it. But often for me, like melodies, so like the, the basic melody of a song will come quite naturally. And then I have to work quite hard on getting the lyrics to fit it. Right. Some people are the other way around where they find it very easy to, to think of lyrics and then the melodies, maybe someone else will have to help them or something. But yeah. But I know, right. like Chris Martin from Coldplay, he describes it like um, wherever songs come from, he just like he just puts himself in front of the piano and lets them lets them sort yeah. of come. And I, he, I and watched him on uh, was it BBC Live Land or something, and they just were like, sing a song about like getting toothpaste on your t-shirt, oh, yeah. and he just like <laughs> he just and you're like, what is happening great, right like, now? It's just yeah. amazing. Um, like that, he's yeah. just yeah, he's one of my, he's one of kind of. I know it's not it's not very cool to like call Coldplay like not many people. Oh uh, yeah, you're way too like, um, <laughs> like yeah. yeah. I'm a massive I'm a massive fan. Like he like as a songwriter, he's just yeah. like kind of a bit baffling, really, a bit of a freak. But yeah. like it, it's interesting when he talks about songwriting because he almost I've seen in interviews where he, he almost makes it sound like a very passive thing, like mm. it's not even him doing it. And like he he sort of talks about it like he's kind of like just like the radio transmitter that kind of receives it and then he's just able to sort of channel that That's and it's, it's it's almost like um i mean to be honest it doesn't work like that for me i have to work quite hard with it you know but um <laughs> i understand kind of what he means sometimes because i do get like sort of sometimes if i'm sat at the piano playing and th looking for ideas um you know, you maybe sit there for like an hour sometimes and you don't get anything. And then suddenly at the very end, you might just, just, um, you know, out of nowhere, you might just get something that you think, oh, that's, that's, you know, that's the start of an idea sort of thing. Yeah. So I can kind of understand it, but I think it just happens on a way different level for a lot of the, um, you know, like the really famous sort of songwriters and stuff. But it's, it's, maybe it's just practice. It's a bit of discipline and also kind of talent, isn't it? But, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it is like um, having the time to do it. it. Yeah, and you're working full time as well, right? And so yeah. um, that's something you've got to kind of throw into the mix and balance as well. So yeah, yeah is yeah. that is that something you? Um, so growing up, did you want to be a musician, and you kind of ended up being an engineer as kind of like a, a second prize, kind of like, oh well, I guess I'll be an engineer, or, or mm, not really. Quite, I think um, I've always just. I've always loved both, to be honest. Like mm. I did, um, I was I was always quite good at sort of science at school and stuff. And then I did um, went to university, sort of civil engineering. I always grew up playing music in the church, so I grew up leading worship, um, play mainly singing, really singing in church. And and then I was in a band with a with a mate uh, during school called Saving Sanchez. Um, still got some stuff. Actually, we had some nice. stuff on. Can people look that up on uh, MySpace? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, it was back in the day where <laughs> where where people put their music on MySpace. You know. Nice. Um, but MySpace is recently. Have like, you still got like a, a gig everything. list on there as well from like you know like two thousand? I still got um, I still got a ticket um, back in back in Sheffield from our first ever gig. Yes. But yeah, so we, we were like a sort of duet, like me and my friend Andy, and um, he played acoustic guitar and I played and I just sang. So it was just like an acoustic duo, but but we like wrote songs together and 
you know, we played a few gigs around Sheffield, just like small gigs and stuff. And uh, yeah. um, so I always did that, you know. Um, and then when I went to uni, um, Andy went to a different uni, went down to Bath, and I went up to Newcastle. Mm. So I sort of um, gigging a bit harder. Yeah, exactly. Well, the the thing is, what I, what I discovered was that because I've always considered myself a singer, but I've never really, I'd never played an instrument really before that, right. except just like basic chords and um, stuff like that. So that was when I sort wow. of had to, I wanted to learn an instrument, so I had something to to write songs with on my own and accompany myself, sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, I've just That's kind of always done it as a as a hobby, really. And then I went to um, finish uni. And started working as an engineer, and I, and I really kind of, um, whereas during uni I'd sort of played worship a lot in church and done that sort of thing, but then I kind of, as things started to change with my faith and started to see 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 the world kind of through a different perspective, I, um, I wanted to kind of go move into songwriting and writing songs out of like the church context and out of like the worship context, yeah. more of a um, an expression of a story and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so one thing really inspired, you know, like we mentioned John Mark McMillan. Mm. I mentioned him earlier. Um, he uh, saw an interview with him and he was saying that, you know, like, he's kind of talking about his process of songwriting and how and how um, a lot of people tried to like, pigeonhole him into being kind of a, a worship leader or a Christian musician. And... Um, this perspective that like he um he wanted to write like a song for his wife and he and he, and he just, i just remember him saying in the interviews like maybe god prefers me to sing a love song a genuine love song about my wife rather than singing great theology directly to his face mm. and i just like wow. there's something about that that i really like really enjoy you know really related to and i was like yeah maybe like there's more to life there's more to music about singing about like the you know the amazing things in life rather than like trying to express you know like doctrine or yeah theological points yeah in in the, in the form of a song almost you know yeah because that's it i mean i have to confess when i say i don't really like music i love something like um i don't know if you listen to like hamilton or been to see hamilton but like oh, yeah, that, yeah. like i, I like, know you're a, I like a song to like a story like just tell mm. me like facts and figures to my music <laughs> <laughs> this, this goes to show I, everyone that loves music is just listen to this going Phil you're an absolute idiot um, yeah. and I love that I love the music of it I love all this but like I mean like I, I can engage with uh, a lot of that stuff and I think it is why when I listen to like Christian worship music I'm all I'm thinking is like oh my gosh this is so technically incorrect um, not about the music you know I know musicians are probably thinking oh my gosh this is a really basic crap <laughs> progression or whatever um, but uh, what fascinates me is um, that is largely what we're doing with Christian music. It, it, it's so um, we're engaging with like, okay, we're singing about God to him. Uh, we're singing yeah. about how great God is. And, and, and there's something for that that's beautiful. I mean, you can sing a, a, a love song about how great your partner is, you know, so, you know, it's fine. But there's something about actually engaging with the depth of that. And, and I think like you're saying there, like, is there, is it not truly an act of worship to enjoy the divinity that is being in love, the the divinity yeah. that is um, just enjoying life, looking at the the tr tree and looking at the leaves and going, "Whoa, this is so cool! Yeah. I love it!" Like just watching life unfold in front of us to engage with that and to sing about that and to um, and to enjoy that um, in all and ways. And also, I, I totally agree, but it, it's also like about not denying. Like music is kind of, um, it's about not denying the reality that we find ourselves in, you know. So the ho like a whole heap of different um, emotions or different um, good and bad situations, you know, we can sing about and mm. write songs about because it's about kind of embracing that the reality of what we live in rather than trying to kind of escape it, you know. Yeah. Um, or like kind of being kind of a denial about it or, or or think that one thing is better than the other you know yeah is that something um, you would say that you see in in like in your experience of christian worship and stuff would you say that was what you felt it was in a lot of ways as, as you kind of progress through that i, I don't know yeah. talk to me about your your engagement yeah. your, your kind of history with with worship because i know that you you were very in the christian world and then you kind of progressed 
through some sort of deconstruction all the while i think you were leading worship and stuff weren't you so how yeah did you it was, it was a bit of, it's, sorry just drop um for me um yeah i kind of grew up grew up in the church and and that was like my first that was really the only experience i had of music really live yeah. playing live music apart from the odd gig i did with my friend andy that i mentioned you know um it was i was you know led worship during uni at church um sort of was involved with a band of students um and the church that we um that was part of had like a 24 7 prayer sort of house and and that, so there's a lot of like live music and opportunities to get involved with that. And then when I came to Manchester, um, a bit of a smaller church, but sort of, you know, they always kind of needed um, people to help out with the music. And yeah. And then, yeah, I, I kind of, for me, what kind of happened was that um, my, my perspective of how I define God um, shifted um, over the course of like two to three years and and to the point that I could no longer really relate to um, relate to the songs I was singing and I felt I felt a bit disingenuous and I felt a bit like a fraud because I, I found myself leading worship um, to and, and everyone like people in the congregation were like having a great time you know mm. and they come up and often they come up to me after like, oh, I really you know I love the um, love the worship and I just felt like a bit of like a fraud because I, I didn't really feel like I fully could relate to or engage with the songs I was singing and a lot of them you know like the, the same songs I've been singing since I was you know a teenager you know and all my life in church really and and I kind of felt like a bit disingenuous like I said it, it it was, it's hard because you have also felt like a sense of expectation to sort of do what you've always done and mm. and um, be the person which my friends in church knew me to be and kind of uh, I didn't want to sort of let them down, you know, and, and be honest about these thoughts. But I think it was only kind of um, like three years ago or so where I sort of started to be honest about um that I was having doubts, that I wasn't seeing the things the same way. And, 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 and then it was kind of through that, pro but to be honest, even through that process, I still continued playing in church um, mm. because music, because it was my main outlet, because I still love playing, yeah. I still love, and then sort of, that was the last thing to go for me really, to step down from the music because I just felt like, um, I just wasn't, you know, I just felt like I wasn't really being honest and I wasn't able to sort of, um, sing the songs, sing the things which I wanted to sing about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that is really tough. Like the dynamic of like wanting to be authentic to yourself, but also fit in with your community. And also, you know, that it's so meaningful to other people. Cause I know um, we were part of the same church and I know loads of people like they would light up when they heard, Oh, Ben's playing this week. You know, like it was, it was genuinely people were like, Oh, cause he's so great at leading it worship and he's so uh anointed or he's so like you know <laughs> oh so many different uh things with uh we said that we probably go oh anointed yeah <laughs> like i don't know what yeah. I <laughs> um, yeah it's but, all this, you know <laughs> um, and especially in the moment you know when you're actually up there i don't know about you but the, the I, weird I know thing me, is like oh yeah well, the weird thing <laughs> is for me like even though i don't really be believe the same things anymore I, like i can still get myself back into that same place mm. you know if i'm listening to because it is such a deeply like emotional experience to listen to, um, you know, to listen to worship music that I yeah. feel like I, st I can still get myself like back into that place of like, um, sort of a deeply um, emotional experience just from listening to it, listening wow. to music like that. Oh man, see, that's, you're obviously a very different human being than I am. <laughs> but then I don't know how, how amped up I got. Again, I'm not that into music. It's not how I've uh, historically particularly connected with God. And so, um, yeah, I've yeah. never been kind of like, oh yeah, worship. You know, people are like, oh, I could have done that worship for another hour. And I've literally never uh, thought that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how did you how did you fit in at Bethel <laughs> dude honestly um it was it was amazing it, it really was amazing but like oh man some of those worship sessions that would go and like you, you'd have times man so we'd have like this big speaker there the, the main speaker was this guy called Bill Johnson and um and 
we would get to hear him speak maybe once every like three weeks because he would travel so much and be gone yeah. and doing all sorts of things or be so busy anyway. And he would come in like to the school that we were a part of. And once every kind of three, four weeks, he'd come in and do a, a hour long session or a two hour session. And it was like, yes, this guy, because he is wise, you know, just the wisdom personified, just eking out of him. And yeah. um, I remember one time, in fact, this happened a couple of times, but like there's this amazing atmosphere of worship and everyone's like, wow, there's people like lying on the floor, just like, wow. God's so good. And the, the worship singer is like it, barely able to stand. It's so like powerful, the, the anointing of God and all this stuff. And and it's like, wow, this is that's great. And I'm there going, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. That's great. Wonderful. I can still uh, engage with this. I can be contemplative. I can I can be in the presence of God, whatever that looks like for me. And, and then I remember Bill coming in and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Worship's over. We're going to get to have some Bill. <laughs> good. I'm excited. Yeah. And then <laughs> Bill just kind of like, lies down on the floor and just he's obviously in that zone he's like yes awesome let's do this and he just does that for two hours and then it all kind of like fizzles out and then everyone goes home and i'm like son of a bitch <laughs> go some teaching every person in that building was like yeah that was amazing even bill could feel that what i was feeling and i'm like i just want to hear bill speak you bastards <laughs> so yeah it's, I, i'm a weird one i know i'm a weird one but uh yeah it's just funny really funny these kind of things yeah um i'm trying to think what the heck we're talking. yeah so like what did, did, did the way that um because obviously anyone can um quote unquote put on the show right so because uh, I, I know this for as being a, a speaker if i go into uh certain types of churches i know the type of speaker they want i know that i should be getting loud and excited i should like you know be you know, reading from the Bible in this particular church, maybe use the Bible a bit less than that church and use anecdotal stories. And I should like, you know, get people pumped up in certain churches. I should go for an audience of participation in one and not in the other. So I kind of, you feel your audience, you know what you're supposed to do to help them engage with it the most. And so obviously I imagine for worship leaders, they know there's a certain way that you perform worship that is not in a sense performing as in look at me how great I am right but performing worship in a sense that this is going to help you step into what you want to step into yeah um am I right in kind of like my observations of that I think um for me for me um it was about kind of um encouraging the congregation to sort of express themselves mm. you know and giving them freedom to to sort of to a kind of lose a bit of their inhibitions and lose a bit of their self-consciousness because like singing like some people love singing some people some people you know struggle to so often what i try to do is, is about sort of allowing them to feel freedom of expression and yeah. and giving space to um sort of um people expressing themselves to god and expressing what's going on you know yeah because for me um like i one of the reasons i love singing is because it's not just it's not just what you say it's how you, it's how you say it you know it's like there's all sorts of ways to sing there's all sorts mm. of musical styles in which to express yourself so um it's kind of about um yeah encouraging people to do that and i think um yeah i mean it, it worship there's all sorts of stuff like resource i know there's like um this the schools online where you can sign up and like learn to be a worship leader and all these yeah. sort of things and and it is it is it is a lot of like people skills a lot of communication a lot of like um emotional intelligence to like read and um, where you know so these are the these are the ways i describe it now i think um a few years ago i would have said you know it's about um it's how you follow the spirit and all these sort of yeah. things. I think, I think, um, and you know, whatever language you use, it's kind of, um, kind of, we mean is sort of a similar thing, but um, yeah. it's kind of about like being able to read the room and read what, where people are at and where, where people, how people desire to sort of express themselves. Yeah. It's funny you um, say, I'm just thinking, I know a few worship um, leaders that do not know how to lead the room. And, and you, 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 we've all been in a worship setting where everyone's kind of done and they're like, come on, let's read the keep singing, you know, or like, or like, yeah. oh, just, and they just keep going. They're just like, they're plowing through. They're going to make it happen. And everyone's kind of like, no, dude, um, you kind of missed the cue. 
They all were kind of like lulling down and ready to kind of transition to something else. Um, and it's funny, even when uh, I've seen that, I've been in, uh, in settings of worship where like you can see it in the band, where you've got like the, the guy that's obviously like the, the main lead worship leader and he's deciding what's going to happen next. But the rest of the band were like, dude, why, why are you doing that? We, we should be doing yeah. something else. Or so, and so there's, there's obviously got to be this kind of like in tuneness, both with your band, I imagine as well, but like, but not just that, but just actually with where people are at, are people, you know, ready to sing yeah. for another two hours or are they kind of like going, no, dude, we're, we're done. Let us speak, listen to Bill. Uh, you know? Yeah, totally. And it, it's not easy, you know, it's, it's, no, it's it doesn't sound it. I think, um, one thing that I, I struggled with when sort of leaving leaving the world of Christian sort of music and going into more sort of like performance. So um, one of the things that I did sort of after leaving, stopping going to church and stopping leading worship was that I started doing a way more sort of live performances in like open mic nights, getting some gigs and um, starting to rehearse with like a, a band. And yeah. one of the things that I really struggled with was that I realised I'd been so... Um, sheltered in in the world of like um christian music in the in the sense of like um it's it's um it's easy to start, kind of get a false sense of uh um confidence with music yeah. because it's so much to do with um sort of allowing people to participate with you rather than performing rather than um, mastering your instrument mastering the song that you play yeah. you know um yeah so, you, you mean in your first gig like everyone in the room just didn't like raise their hands and start singing your lyrics <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> well it's just um, what's wrong with just, these people <laughs> i think because uh, it's just different you know it's different it's different um it's like because so because i've not really played outside of a church for um for a long time I went to like my first open mic night and I was sat down and it's just like it's just filled with incredible musicians and I'm thinking yeah I've got to follow these guys you know because because they're just um, absolute masters of their instrument that they they've mm. they've done the circuit playing at the open mics for years they'd probably you know do one or two open mics a week you know they've played gigs and stuff so they just sort of they just do it without thinking you know um, whereas, you know, you put them in a, a setting where they have to sort of lead um, a room of people to sing a song yeah. or um, they, they would really struggle. But in yeah, terms of performing, it's like, um, so it's just a different skill, you know, and, and having to sort of get a bit, like really invest more time into mastering the instrument and like mastering sort of um, variations in how you play stuff, you know, so not yeah. just playing like the same, same style. Yeah. Um, was that was that discouraging to go through that and, and realize oh wow yeah, a little like, bit <laughs> this, am I because was there I mean for me I would imagine very much uh, I don't know what it would be like like me um, being used to speaking in a church well everyone in church wants you to do well they're going to be encouraging they're gonna clap they're going to say like oh you did a great that was a really good message no one's coming to me and going well, that was a really shitty message Phil you could try harder you know what I mean people yeah, have yeah. said oh I didn't like what you said there or I disagreed or but on the whole everyone's kind of like very quote unquote christian right it's nice encouraging yeah. people but um if i was to transition and suddenly try and do like some sort of like public speaking performance i imagine it'd be a really different uh context you know people actually are like no dudes we're paying you 10 grand to come here and speak for an hour to this big business and we want you to say something profound good and on the money um, and we're going to call you out if it's not like i very quickly go dude i, I don't i don't think i'm cut out for that um, like was there that kind of like element of like I think I think it's a lot people are paying to see you or you know there's there's things yeah. like that that it's got to be a very different dynamic. Yeah, it's a good question. I think I think the the main difference really is is the emphasis, you know, the focus. Mm. So when you're playing in a in a church setting, you're sort of you're more of the um, what we would call the vessel. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, God, uh, um, but non Christians, if you think about how 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 obscure that language is, like, it's, it's like you're, it's you're, the, like, you're the one which is sort of encouraging. So you're helping people engage with this deeper yeah. truth, this deeper reality, this um, you know, um, this deeper purpose. When when you're singing more as like uh, outside of the church, it, you are the focus. Yeah. So it, you're you are performing. Mm. rather than rather than sort of leading um so the the emphasis is it's a lot more it's a lot um you're less sheltered i would say 
Yeah, it um, feels really vulnerable. Just you describing yeah, it, I'm just picturing, you know, 100 people with their eyes all up in the sky and like, yeah. you know, singing to God yeah. and suddenly just all looking at you and going, all right. It really depends. Though. It's, it's like the, it's, it depends on the atmosphere. Like in open mics, it's it's more it's more like that because it's just you and a your instrument, yeah. and and often you play into a room of people that don't know your songs. Yeah. Um, once you get a bit of a following and you play gigs, obviously with with fans that know your songs, it's a lot yeah. it's a lot nicer. And also the dynamic of playing with a band is 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 I. I absolutely love it. Like we, I just started rehearsing every week with a band to launch my EP. And then obviously everything happened. Hey, Corona, Corona, right? So we had to cancel all the gigs, but but I'm really looking forward to playing, like to getting some gigs yeah. with the band after. Um, You're you not know, doing after. like um, practice sessions via Zoom or anything? <laughs> well, we t- we, d- we were talking about it, but the problem is that you get like a lag. A lag. So like yeah. you play and then like they're like three seconds behind. So it just sounds like an absolute mess. Yeah. Everyone has to play slightly off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, oh, we, we want, um, we're going to work on some, st- like me and the, um, I have a good mate from work who's, well, I don't, don't know if I mentioned, but I've been furloughed. So at the moment, I'm just sort of yeah. um, sitting on my ass all day. But um, <laughs> no, trying to keep busy. <laughs> but my, my colleague from work is plays bass. And, and so we're trying to do a bit of songwriting together, send, send some stuff back and forth and, and then yeah. work on some, work on some new songs and some do you, covers do you prefer stuff. that writing with someone because that's what i noticed with um yeah. the watching rocket man you know obviously like elton was like i do music the the guy was at bernie he's like i got some lyrics for you i can't yeah. even imagine like i, like, I, I do enjoy it or... i just i just i'm not used to it to be honest right. i don't i don't i don't um it's i'm not i'm not as good at it because yeah. i've not done it as much you know I've, not, I've never really written with someone it's always been me that's written a song and then i've shown it to someone and maybe they'll just play bass or guitar with it but in yeah. terms of writing a song with them um yeah. it feels like I, it has loads of potential to take you to the next level in a lot of ways like oh, i yeah, imagine like and, and totally it's like you sit down with you another find, writer and they go that's good the, but what about this so yeah, yeah you find oh, yourself sorry. getting in a bit of a rut as well like because you you um, people naturally write certain types of songs like you know like you listen mm. to like chris martin songs from coldplay and like you can sort of tell it's a chris martin song just from yeah. the way like that it's formulated and stuff and um and same with like ed sheeran and stuff like that and um, people naturally write a certain way so it's nice to get that different input and and like because people that have different musical sort of um you know interests like Ollie, who plays bass, he's much more into sort of blues and um, soul sort of stuff. So he he has that sort of, he puts that um, different taste on mm. his interpretation of the stuff I send him and stuff. But yeah, that's really cool, really interesting. So um, I'm just trying to think. We we're looking at like um, the process of deconstruction and, and thinking of like how that affected you in your worship how, how did this affect you in like your in your personal life as you're going through this right because obviously you're you're a worship leader in in all of this um yeah but like that's got to be um on some level going along to church you know leading worship people have a very kind of like there's a public perspective of who ben is when you're going up on the stage and you're singing all about how much you love god and this is what god looks like and this is what christianity is or whatever the songs are we're singing i, I don't know you know but like, that creates a picture of oh ben must agree with all this and ben must be like that um yeah. and then you get off the stage and that's not where you're at i mean you're not even there on the stage as well maybe but but you know what i mean this is almost like these two dynamics and that's yeah, like i, I think struggled that's, with that's, well. that's kind of what i what i struggled with like what you're saying the, the fact that the sort of like I said earlier, I felt a bit disingenuous because mm. there's a perception that I'm sort of maybe in a certain place and the reality is that I wasn't there. Yeah. I wasn't believing the same things that maybe I was singing about or, um, but then it, it was, it, you know, it was, to be honest, it was a long process and it was quite a, um, at times painful, but it, it, it was, it was a long process that took a while to be honest with myself about really, because um, it's like with anything when you're sort of so um, invested in a belief system or um, m- my whole community was built around this, um, you know, this uh, kind of truth. Yeah. You know, a lot of my friendships um, were, 
were forged around this this belief in this this ultimate reality, this ultimate truth that dictated sort of everything. Um, you know, so even at uni, sort of most of my friendship groups were around the Christian Union at, at um, uni, um, around church, and 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 it's kind of like the main thing which kept my community. So it is. So when you go through it, it's it's quite difficult to be honest because because it costs it costs a lot and yeah. and and often you feel like um kind of scared to um really engage with these thoughts because you think um that perhaps you know it's going to cost more than than you're ready to give you know yeah um and that's why kind of i think people have to come through this process in their own time really that yeah. and and often <laughs> You know, like I listened to um, the Rhett and Link podcast recently and and um, about kind of their journey um, of deconstructing yeah. their faith. And, and one of the things they were saying is it's like, you know, th- they summarize their journey into like a two hour podcast. But they were saying, you know, this this has happened over six, seven years, you know, of yeah. slowly sort of changing stuff. And and you get like, you know. <laughs> one of the ways that Rhett described it was like you're wearing a jumper and then you slowly peel it away and then it becomes like a vest top and then a tank top and then you just think I'll oh, just take it off <laughs> and it's like <laughs> it's like this yeah. isn't doing this isn't this it's isn't good for anyone it, really. <laughs> yeah so it's kind of like that really and um and you get to and I think so one of the songs on the EP is kind of about this process of it called silhouette and 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 the idea that like um it's, it's sort of a kind of the process of being able to be honest with yourself and coming to a point where you you're at peace with it you know mm. you're okay with it because i think f- for a large part my sort of upbringing in the church and i'm not saying this for every church or but it was just kind of how i perceived it was that the the Christian upbringing I had didn't really encourage critical thinking and didn't really encourage questions or, or, yeah. or, or, or unknowable answers or, you know, mystery. And um, it was kind of a big emphasis on kind of knowing, believe, like basically belief systems and believing um, the right thing, you know? And then if you had doubts about that, what you'd end up doing is kind of, um, talking to someone that didn't have those doubts mm. so that then they could convince you that your doubts are unfounded or whatever. And, and it's kind of reducing faith to something which is perfectly reasonable and perfectly explainable, you know, and not dealing really with, um, with levels of like subtlety or nuance or um, maybe things which aren't so black and white, you know? Mm. And um, yes, yeah, so there's a line in that, that first song silhouette where it goes, I still love you, but differently. I'm not holding on as though you're going to leave. And the mm. idea behind that is that it's kind of, for a long time, I was kind of trying to hang on to this faith. You know, I was trying to hold on to this uh, way of thinking that I'd ha- that had been really good to me. You know, it had yeah. been a good friend to me. It kept me safe. It had given me a good community at uni, given me a, like um, a, a really nice way to see the world that everything fit into and I was ha- trying to hold on to that uh, and view my faith as something which I needed to hold on to um, and then rather than holding faith for something which sort of holds on to me instead yeah. and that's something which is sort of so it's it sort of takes the responsibility off you know it takes yeah. the, the pressure off yourself to kind of no no what you believe almost because yeah um you're able to sort of just just whatever it is whatever you're feeling whatever you believe in just just let it be just and let it be let, yeah. let that let it um you know um kind of not feel that, like it's there's one the one thought that's always really encouraged me through this process was something i read by um an author called pete rollins who i don't know if you i think you know him don't you yeah yeah but he um i heard him he was in like a podcast with rob bell and I've, he's written quite a few books and stuff and he's quite like um his brand of theology 
almost is, is a lot about like encountering God in the everyday. So, um, the, uh, you know, like the whole thing when Jesus says, you know, if you feed the hungry, you're actually feeding me. And if you mm. clothe the naked, you're actually clothing me. And, and about relating to Christ in interactions with other people, you know, and, and how we treat the actual real life that we're in. And he was saying that, you know, for a long time, Christians sort of treated um, evangelism or truth like we've got to go somewhere and and give them truth you know we take the truth with us we take jesus with us yeah and and so like this was this was kind of something which i witnessed all the time during university and so i, I never really um could never really get behind it or feel passionate about doing it because i and for that reason i kind of always sort of um reacted against it but this like we used to do something called text to toasty where like Tilly used to do this as well. This is like, yeah. I, this is Christian it's Union like, 101, yeah. right? <laughs> no, because you can't, you can't, you can't, um, you, I mean, you don't have sex or alcohol. So what you have to do is <laughs> the next best thing, toast is, you know. <laughs> to be fair, a good toasty. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, good uh, ham, and, ham and grated cheese, I mean. But anyway, so the, the thing is, um, so the idea is that people would like text a question, you know, about faith or Christianity, and then you prepare an answer and then you'd go to their dorm and, or their room That's in so the hall funny. of residence and you give them a toast and you give them an answer for their question. Yeah. You know? And it's, and it's like, a, it's all about certainty and like explaining to yeah. them. Why. We have an answer. Um, Whatever your question, we have the answer and we'll bring a yeah. toasty. Uh, yeah exactly and obviously did you, did you ever sit down it, and like free collude and like talk with each other and go guys i don't know what the answer is to this do you know what the answer is? Oh, oh maybe this or maybe we should do this like like I mean, must have, at times just... she must have got questions that were like oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, to, to be honest i was always like um i was always not feeling great when you were making toasties so... right <laughs> yeah no, i'll make the toasties like... guy in the back yeah, when when this was going on, I never really got involved. I was always like uh, miraculously not feeling great that night. Or, <laughs> um, oh, it was the busy, amount of times right? I've been ill on uh, evangelism kind of moments. It's amazing. Yeah. It's like a miracle. Oh, yeah. So it's like this whole this whole thing of like we we bring uh, you know we bring the truth and and we can we can have a reasonable explanation. We can provide and. And, and also like something called lunch bars where you'd bring your friends and there'd be a speaker there which, mm. which would, ex, you know, explain why, um, fe like faith, why there's a God basically. And, yeah. and, and, and the problem with that is that it kind of, it can be quite exhausting because yeah. you're, you're expected to have an answer. You know, you expect yeah. to have this truth that works for everyone. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, for me, it kind of, it just wasn't working anymore. And, and one of the things that Pete Rollins says is that rather than having that mindset of going somewhere and, and giving Jesus to them, how about we go somewhere and we discover Jesus with them and we, and we, we see Christ in them, you know, and that's kind of a lot of what is, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, um, like, entire <laughs> like books but that's a lot of his like sort of emphasis about like discovering christ and that's something that really sort of um really encouraged me because it takes all the pressure off you know that mindset yeah. of like of kind of we're no longer expected to we can actually oh actually i'm able to discover truth in a different tradition or or mm. discover truth in something else or see 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 christ you know, in ways which I hadn't, um, you know, and, and it also it takes the pressure off kind of, um, it, it, it makes you able to relate to, uh, enjoy life more, I think, because yeah. you, you, you're not, um, you're not seeing the world through like these like deep, like sort of spiritual, um, over spiritualized and everything, but you're able yeah. to sort of, engaged with christ in the everyday engaged with what however you define god you're able to experience god in every day you know it's a bit like your musical rut you were talking about right so you get into a thing you're writing a song you can only see it through your lens maybe you're like writing a very blues or soul or jazz or pop or whatever but you like doing your thing and that's how you see everything and and then you bring your song to your friends and they're like dude oh man if we added some uh rb to this this would pop and you're like suddenly yeah. like, whoa um, and it's really, I think to me, I think a lot of the time our spirituality 
can be that where we we're in such a protected bubble the only reason we ever go out is to try and drag people into the bubble and yeah. every moment we're out there we're just blurting about the bubble right we don't really want to don't tell me about your worlds don't you dare expose me to anything that's too scary or dangerous yeah, or yeah, wrong yeah, yeah. And, and actually, when you start to let go of that and realize, okay, I have a bubble and there's plenty of great stuff in here, but maybe if I let go of my bubble, maybe if I go into other people's bubbles and go, hey, what have you got to teach? Like, what, what could, tell me about your world. It suddenly, it, it, it totally. adds depth yeah. and dimension to the song, uh, to, so to speak, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think we really do miss out on that for sure. Um, hey, Ben, let's... Um, Let's play some of these songs because we just touched yeah. on Silhouette and I, I reckon um, people will love to listen to this. I don't actually know how we're going to do it here. Um, I don't know if can you just play it on your end and I'll play it on mine. Is that probably the best thing? We'll just listen to it roughly and then I'll, um, I'll cut them in so people can hear them uh, yeah. in a decent quality. But I have no idea. How to so do if I them. play it on, uh, yeah, so we'll play it and then you can just cut the MP3 file in. flame and fire and ice I drew dividing lines between us and them, oh you and I I sold sweet promises about how to fill the emptiness I spun a thousand lines but life don't seem so black and white and all my kingdoms are falling down I'm not lonely, I'm not the only one I drink from wells dug in ancient ground Waters of plenty, I'm not empty yet I've been told many times of cherubim in the heavenly heights. I took your great advice, but life is not so black and white. Oh, so sweet promises about how to fill the emptiness. I still love you, but differently. Awesome. Okay, cool. Dude, talk, talk me through. Um, so we've touched a bit on where you were at this time in your life. You know, you were in the midst of church still, you're still losing worship and stuff like that, but you're, you're going through some process of deconstruction. You're going through having doubts, not sure, not certain. And I'm listening to this uh, song and I'm, I'm hearing that all through. I'm kind of picking up. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I can totally, uh, I can almost go back to my time in my life when I was going through those same kind of periods of doubt and uncertainty and questioning things. Um, and yet being in the midst of people that all have the answers and are black and white and it's certain. And it was a really tough time to go through. And I didn't know if I had permission to ask these questions. I didn't know 
a how to certainly not in the group i was standing amongst um but then it yeah. feels in the song as well there's a there's a there's a progression so that, that that's there in the song but there's also within the song there's a there's a progression into your freedom of realizing that that's okay yeah um, yeah like i mean there's so many lyrics that jump out at me and you know um I'm looking at my notes and for people that look at the video. This is my notes on the lyrics. I'm like looking like I can't read that. <laughs> this is my problem when I like get excited and write stuff down. Um uh right, maybe that we look at the ring. I'm not looking. So I think that one that jumps out at me uh huge, and I think it'll jump out at a lot of people listening to this as well, is is the lyric, I'm not lonely, I'm not the only one. Uh, because yeah. I think deconstruction is a lonely journey for a lot of people. Um, yeah. and, and is that how you did experience it uh, at some point? Because it sounds well, like I from think, that you, you maybe did I think, it. Yeah, I think for, for me, um, I'm, I was really lucky that um, I never really felt, I never really felt on my own in it, to be honest, because okay. I had a really great group of friends that were also, a lot of them were also sort of experiencing the same things. Um, I think when it, when I first started um, sort of going through the process, there was a time where I kind of felt a bit on my own. Um, and that was sort of before, like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of before I was able to sort of start being honest with myself. You know, that was kind yeah. of it, at the time when you start kind of trying to fight it and you, and you just think um, I need to screw up my eyes, hold on tight and, you know, and maybe they'll go away or I need to, you know, pray harder or, speak to people with the right answers and but um and then but what ended up happening was i was i sort of started being honest with myself realizing it wasn't going to go away anytime soon and so um sort of started just being honest and talking to people about it reading mm. certain books um that are about from people that have been through similar process and and i ended up realizing that like there is a whole heap of um people that have already been through this yeah um there's a whole heap of sort of um you know there's books out there that have great language to communicate the process because i think for me at the time it was really hard for me to articulate what it was i was going through you know um and it's really hard to to um to, to explain it to someone who's maybe not been through that process um yeah. And so it, you can feel alone, but then what happened for me was that I was able to discover a whole heap of sort of resources that put great language on it and yeah. able to articulate it. And then- um, Who were some of your favorite resources? Like what oh, were some so, of your biggest so, so, kind of names to be like, oh, they really- So a massive, a, massive, a massive turning point for me was I read a book called The Great Spiritual Mi Migration. Okay. Uh, by Brian, Brian McLaren, McLaren, right? Yeah. yeah, and that for me was like really kind of the start of the start of the process where I was able to write, be like, wow, actually this is, this is, uh, you know, this is legitimate what I'm feeling. You know, mm. I don't need to hide. I don't need to feel ashamed by it. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and, and that kind of, that, that book really is about his, um, it's maybe about kind of rethinking about, how Christianity um, is expressed and and how um, people can sort of kind of rethinking um, rethinking how faith uh, is expressed where it, he talks a lot about how Christianity has become so belief focused that mm -hmm. that um, in, that you know you have to be you have to believe certain things in order to sort of um, be a Christian and be, um, and it's, it's so like focused on beliefs that, um, that if you have doubts or, or something, it's hard to really engage with those things in, in the context of like uh, conventional Christianity. So what he kind of speaks about is about like a, a, a bit of a shift in emphasis rather than being so belief focused, more being focused on the way of love defined by the life of Jesus. Yeah. And um, and at its heart is like a deep, it's like a deeply, um, um, I think he's like deeply compelled by the person of Jesus, you know, deeply um, inspired and and enamoured with the person of Jesus, but at the same time, not so not so focused on 
specific beliefs or specific doctrines or theology and it's more about a focus on like um how do i like live like jesus and how yeah. and focus on the the way that he basically treated people and you know stuff like that wow. which and for me that was kind of like the, the turning point and then awesome. there was a there was a couple of other books as well which sort of helped me in terms of how I related specifically to the bible um one of them was called um what was it called it was called the gift of the jews by okay. um, thomas thomas cahill, thomas cahill. Mm. that book was really cool uh, he was so sort of, his, his whole thing is kind of how um, rather than viewing the bible as like a a book where it's given by god you know to people he sort of presented the idea that the bible's more of like a unfolding narrative of people trying to figure out who god is yeah or trying to figure out the sort of the best way to explain yeah you know um and so which is how the jews of, have always kind of approached their yeah. scriptures anyway which don't tell of, christians that because that ruins our idea that the bible was like penned by god personally yeah you know? <laughs> and for me that was that was fun i, I sort of already believed that anyway but it just helped it was great to just like um to read that because um it just it just made sense you know yeah. <laughs> like it, it's 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 more about looking at it from a like a holistic viewpoint where rather than seeing it so black and white you're actually seeing this is like a this is like a, an unfolding story of people trying to make sense of um and that's why like you know you see things in there which don't seem to um to make sense or don't there's there's you know there's things in there that might not have like and much um, backing scientifically or archaeological mm. evidence and stuff but it's about people trying to make sense and communicate a meaning so looking at the kind yeah. of the meaning because one of the things that rob bell says is whenever you read um something in the bible rather than um well, the, one of the first questions you should ask is not like is this true or is this literally true or whatever but ask the question why did they write it down why did someone feel the need to write this down you know yeah. Um, sorry i'm getting think... attacked by a wasp was like, just flew right at me i was like uh -huh. just sitting there next to me I was... okay keep going but if i like yeah. run out of the room it's because a wasp <laughs> is like just flown into my ear or something <laughs> um that's that's so huge i was talking about that yesterday on um i did a, a live uh, instagram live and um and people were talking about like how i how do you take the bible literally or you know like not and and just kind of talking about how first and foremost before we even ask is this literal we should ask what does it mean what's the point of the story yeah, because yeah, yeah. whether it happened or not they told this story for a purpose um and there's a depth to purpose there that often we completely miss because we're choosing to read a theological text as a history text i think i think it's, it's just, weird though because the, the more people i speak to i think it's, it's easier said than done though because my personality is I engage a lot on like an ideological level. Mm. So I can read some, I've, I've always found it really easy to read something and be like, um, Oh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's not, um, yeah, you know, literally true because I can, I can see it as like, um, a philosophy to live by or the meaning behind the story. Um, is like, it's okay. You know, it's, yeah. it's, I can, I can, I can get the meaning, but then, I think it's just a personality trait because, and then other people are really kind of struggle to. Um, it's literally the end of the world for them. They're like, "What do yeah. you mean? It's not true." Yeah, <laughs> but it's it's not a bad thing because I, I just feel like maybe there's there's um maybe it should bother me more. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it should. Maybe. It really does bother me as well. I think again because I like to deal with things in the kind of abstract anyway. Generally, that's how I talk about everything and anything. Because me yeah. and Till, I'll I'll talk about something. I'll be like having this conversation with Till and be like, oh, like imagine this. What about this? What about this? And she's like, just starting to weep. And I'm like, what's even happening right now? It's because like, she's not living in the abstract, and I'm talking about like, yeah. I'm like, hey Till, imagine we had a kid, and then like nine years later it died. How do you think we'd respond to that? And I'm like asking genuinely. I actually had this conversation one time. We were watching a TV show about like someone, a kid died or something. And I was like, oh, how do you think we would deal with that? That's literally my thought processes. So I was like, oh, like, and I'm not, for Till, she's not just exploring the idea of that. She's literally just lived it. She's like, why, why would you kill our child? You know, like, yeah, yeah. Like, and so it's just people engage with these things so differently. Um, yeah. I think we can forget that. So when I'm looking at the Bible, I'm not engaging with it on, 
as much of a emotional level uh, it's maybe a lot more um head like ideologically um but also even things like um to me it's not important whether it was uh it was a, a historically factual event when it says that the israelites killed this group of people i'm like wow well, okay yeah sure maybe maybe not i don't know i wasn't there no one that wrote it was there no one yeah. has ever been there so like let's put that to the side and all the archaeologists that have dug it up said no it didn't happen so i'm like i'm certainly going to put it to the side and go okay well let's ignore that for a second and go why are they telling me that the israelites killed all these people what what's the point of that and what's who is god in this part of the story and what's yeah. he like and why is he like that um so for me that's that's easier to do but i think for a lot of people um i think a lot of people they've been taught to understand that their faith it, you can know that your faith is true because the bible says it because yeah. the bible shows us this we know that this happened we know that we'll go to heaven we know that we're safe and they're not we know that we're in and they're not we know that um whatever we can have a relationship with jesus because the bible says right it's the, it's the cha yeah. childhood chant isn't it the bible tells me so um so the second that the bible tells us something that might not actually have happened everything suddenly seems to be in question um and there maybe it, maybe it's a bit more just being a bit more all or nothing we talked about people being all or nothing earlier. yeah yeah maybe it's a bit of that as well because i don't even see that i'm like oh well no i'm just talking about this one passage it's that type of literature so i'm saying that type of literature shouldn't be taken literally but you can take another type of pa like passage in the bible very literally because it was meant to be literal um yeah. but it seems like i i have a question constantly fielded to me frequently like i mean every every couple of days i get a message saying phil if you're saying that this didn't actually happen how can you trust anything in the bible and i'm like Oh, I just have never even had that logical thought jump that if mm -hmm. Genesis wasn't a literal account of how the world was created, I couldn't possibly trust that some guy called Luke told me Paul went to this city. Like, yeah. that seems like such a, 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 a magical, mystical jump to connect those two things. And yet, yeah. that is how a lot of people, they're suddenly like, well, I can't trust anything in here. Um, and so yeah i think it's just it's very different people and different uh, ways of engaging uh, yeah. i can't remember how we got on this topic it's fascinating <laughs> um, um yeah but let, let's look at a couple other lyrics because there's a couple of lyrics in here that, that jumped out at me um it, so one of the lyrics that jumped out at me um was that you were talking about um uh you know you take people's uh, great advice and uh, about you know life being black and white but you're realizing it's not so black and white and you're saying you're sold sweet promises of how to fill the emptiness like what is the emptiness to you like when, when you're talking about that yeah. like is that something that you um yeah i'll i won't i won't qualify that question to try and uh, i think um, yeah what i was trying to communicate with that lyric was just about um of not being so hung up on certainty mm. you know not trying to have um kind of nice neat answers for everything and being able to be okay with kind of what some some people might say sort of mysticism or kind of mystery you know mm. being okay with that and is that what not... you would see the emptiness to be then almost like the emptiness is this kind of mysterious uncertainty doubt like we don't know um, yeah i think so and and kind of being okay with maybe not having neat um definitions for things you know so yeah. so for instance one of one of the questions which um one of the first questions which i get asked now by a lot of like my friends which are still sort of um would um sort of you know involved in the christian world and stuff and believe that um the first questions i get asked is do you do you still believe in god you know mm. and and it sounds like a very simple question, but it's, it's a very, it's a very, very difficult question for me to answer because that term, when we, when people say God, it, it it's very, very, they it's mean a lot very, very things, loaded. Right? Yeah. It's an extremely loaded um, yeah. word that means completely different things to different people. Yeah. So like, there's a simple answer where it's like, no, I don't believe it in god in the same way that i used to yeah um but at the same time you know it's maybe on some level on some level i probably do believe in god 
and 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 I think um, there's and the, but the reason it's kind of difficult for me to answer is because I'm not I'm not so belief I'm not belief focused like I used to be. Mm. So it's it's not that um, I don't put so much value on my you know individual beliefs um, and more focus on kind of like how do I live well right now sort of thing and yeah. how does it actually impact my life you know um, so I think you know in some ways I probably do believe in God in some ways I probably don't but um, I definitely don't believe in the same way I used to and, and so kind of that's what I kind of meant by that um, being okay with that tension you know being okay with the ability to being okay with not being able to answer certain questions or or mm. not um, have um, the nice um, defined sort of beliefs that I used to have you know yeah nice man that's it's huge because I think we we forget that like you know I, I often the way I would say it is uh, I like to ask a, a very fundamental Christian if a if a fundamental Muslim came up to him and said do you believe in Allah um, what would he say because the, that word God Allah just means God you know it, it, yeah yeah of course he believes in God but I certainly don't believe in Allah Oh, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 you know, and so like, or, or so I believe in my God in the way I see him, but I don't believe in your God in the way you see him. So even just in that one instance, we can see, oh, there's, there's, there's nuance to this conversation. Yeah. Um, and we need to be clarifying. What are we, what are we talking about when we say the word God? Yeah. It's, what it's are we really talking the, about here? And I think that's one of the things that like Pete Rollins um, helped me with um, when sort of reading a lot of his stuff was actually this, there's, there's a whole heap of ways that, um, people use that word God to to what they mean when they use that word. You know, there's a whole yeah. heap of different descriptions, um, and and he sort of goes into detail about like the, the different sort of theological sort of you know ideas. But but it's it's really difficult. It's it's a much more complicated question than um, than often like people sort of think about. You know, they yeah. they, they don't absolutely fully maybe it's it's yeah. I think when you're when you're a very black and white kind of more fundamental Christian, though, um, it isn't a difficult question. So there isn't much thought to yeah. be had because there is one God. He looks like this and this is how we understand him. And we're right about it. And so when I'm saying, do you believe in God? I mean, do you believe this or do you believe some other false God, some demon yeah. pretending to be God, some whatever false religion? Or, but it is quite clear cut. Like my question to you is clear cut. And then the problem that you have is like you go, well, answering your question no <laughs> uh, yeah. like answering that like do i believe in the god that like you know murders children so that you know like as laughing the other day so has posted a meme of like you know like wait so god got upset by other people killing children in child sacrifices to false gods so he yeah. told israel to go there and kill all the people including the children i'm like so Killing children is good if you do it for the right gods, but bad if you do it for the wrong. I'm like, this is like crazy. And so like, I'm like answering that question. No, I don't believe in that God at all. That's insanity. Yeah. Um, but then if you ask me, do I think there is something beyond everything and in everything that is completely ineffable that we will always be chasing and not quite be able to put our finger on that we will always be describing and yet never capture with our words. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If yeah. you ask me, do I think Jesus um, creates a very real um, image and, and, and representation? Is he the image of that invisible being, divine being? Yeah, I think he is in many, many ways. Jesus perfectly represents what that, that beautiful yeah. thing that is within and beyond all things. So yeah, I believe in God. I could call that God and, and I'd be okay with that. My hesitancy to call it the word God is because you've used this word and it's so freaking toxic now. Yeah. So that if I say it to someone that doesn't believe what you believe, they're going to think I believe what you believe. And yeah. I do not want to be associated with that. You know, and, and I yeah. think that's the, that's the tension is we, that certain words have almost been uh, hijacked. It's, they have so much meat. And I think it's, uh, I love what you're saying there, Phil. I think that's really... Um, that's why I like being friends with you because you're able to, <laughs> to say well, things. I'd be friends really with well. you. We, we just uh, we bounce off <laughs> each think, other. Um, really interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think 
maybe because sort of we've both sort of grown up in the church and a lot of these words have a lot more meaning for us than perhaps you know some people might not really kind of think what's a big deal about just saying you know yes or yeah. um but the these words have a lot of like um sort of deeper sort of they're very loaded in that sense and they have like a lot of um almost like unintended meanings behind them yeah. um but it's kind of I sort of um react against them <laughs> you know like yeah. certain 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 phrases certain um when people say certain things that are sort of almost like you hear them all the time in when when you're in church I sort of they, they lose their meaning a little bit because you realize actually this kind of there's a lot more sort of maybe going on than I used to yeah. appreciate or yeah. yeah no it's cool it's really cool we could probably go on more stuff off of silhouettes to be honest with you, but let's yeah. just jump into the next song we talked about that we'd, we'd play um wild horses right Would you have noticed if I faltered The words I used to speak but cannot say Would you have noticed if I wandered My feet discreetly carried me away Why, why, why The wild horses run away Surely I Had to leave, I couldn't stay And miles, miles, miles Outlaws and renegades As surely as I could As surely as I should If I altered the lyrics, I'm cynical and tired from all the focus on things we can see, hear, feel, or describe. Why, why, why? Wild horses run away But surely I Had to leave, I couldn't stay And miles, miles, miles Outlaws and renegades As surely as I could as surely as I should Horses to cold waters run because just because wild horses to cold waters run because just because wild horses to cold waters. Made better notes this time. <laughs> Actually, I don't think they are. I'm looking at them now. I'm like, damn it! <laughs> awesome. Why, why don't you um, talk me talk me through this song? Talk me through um, what, what were you thinking? What 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 were you trying to capture in writing this? Um, this this song was kind of about the process of kind of leaving um, leaving kind of church community really and leaving um leaving that that sense of security and safety that's found in having this like united um purpose um kind of 
yeah just kind of being honest with myself and and I, I think this song like the, the lyrics in the verse are kind of they do capture kind of a bit of um grief in in mm. terms of leaving that and 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 sadness at kind of coming to terms with that and and kind of um the feeling of maybe uncertainty you know of what yeah. because if um because you feel like kind of on one level this is kind of you know what all i knew um uh, so yeah it sort of captures that and then the, the the idea the idea with the sort of the lyric about wild horses um so the the bit at the end where it's kind of wild horses and cold waters run because just because the idea that like you know this is this is just what they do you know mm. <laughs> like <laughs> that's the nature of these things you know river rivers run they they yeah. move on they move forward you can't you can't stop them um the same with like um wild horses and and i just felt like um it's kind of yeah it's it, i was trying to communicate the idea of kind of feeling like i needed to i needed to leave in order to be be able to be honest with myself yeah. you know and that I wanted to be able to ex um, explore maybe other parts of, um, you know, other part, other thoughts I was having, other doubts I was having, and I wasn't able to do that in the context that I was in, almost. Yeah, you, you mentioned there's a, a alert that jumps out about your head and your heart feeling divided. It's like, yeah, what what did that look like for you in the in the process? Like, you know, like. Um, well, the, the the end of that lyric is um, "Let it be, just let it be," and it's mm. it's almost similar, very similar to what I discussed earlier with the emptiness thing about feeling okay with yeah. with the fact that maybe not f um, not being sure of what I believe or not having nice neat answers about the things I believe and not being really able to communicate or articulate the things which I'm experiencing, but just letting that letting that be you know so um um one of the things it's kind of that was in my head when i was writing that was the, the book that i mentioned earlier the great spiritual migration by brian mccormick he talks kind of about about beliefs and he says you know like on the one hand kind of beliefs are seen as this quite simple thing you either believe it or you don't but he sort of in the book he talks a little bit about that there's all sorts of different beliefs and it's possible to maybe believe something um on like a deep level but maybe not be able to really have like be able to articulate that or you might believe something but then not act on it you know this all and, and there's like a cycle i can't remember um you know he's cleverer than me so he'll be able to describe it better but the idea that you know beliefs actually are quite a um a spectrum you know, and yeah. there's all sorts of different ways that that, so um, kind of, I was just trying to articulate that about like how maybe like my head can be feeling something, but my heart feeling something else. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, and but just like being okay with that, you know, not trying to like hold on to something or feeling like I should be feeling something or feeling an expectation that I should have a certain belief or, but, but just letting it, letting myself experience that and just like yeah. going with it, you know? No, absolutely. Like, I think, I think people underestimate uh, people that haven't been through this process. Um, I don't think they fully allow themselves to engage with how hard a process it is. Like this is a lot of the time. I think the narrative around people that are going through what what, what we've been through um, is, oh, they're just they're backslidden, or oh, they just wanted to, um, you know, they just wanted to feel better around their worldly friends, or oh, they just wanted to accept homosexuality, or oh, they just wanted to live with their partner. Or, you know, it's almost like we just like. Uh, we had some thing we wanted to do or uh, or we wanted to fit in with a different way of doing things and so we just were like man okay like sack all this stuff um and it feels it feels very um it, it's very uh it doesn't at all respect the fact that this is this is deep in us this was everything to us this was this is every fiber of my being thought through this world was was and it operated through this world i was a christian that was who i was first and foremost before 
anything I was before I was my parents' kid, before I was, you know, my my wife's husband, before I was a, a employer employee at this company, like before any of my identities, my first and foremost identity was like, I am a child of God. I am a Christian. I believe yeah. this stuff. I live this stuff. This is who I am. I'm a part of this community that believes this stuff, this global church that's like on fire for God. And, you know, like I think it's very unfair to just go, oh, you never really believed that. Or, oh, you've just, you've just like put that to the side because you didn't really care about it. That, that's yeah. not what's happening for, I mean, maybe, maybe some people that might be fair. I don't know. I mean, but on no, the, I think, my I think experience so, that most people yeah. really were engaged with that. And this is a hard wrestle. Um, it's a hard, it's, it's a very, yeah, yeah, go for it. I think it's, um, it's a complicated process. It's, it's, and it's not one which it happens over for, for most people. It happens over a long, uh, a long period, you know? Yeah. Um, just in the same way that, you know, you don't throw out everything out at, at once, you know? Um, but it, it happens at a pace which people can are able to process it and be, and be able to be honest about it. So in that sense, it, it's kind of, it's perfect because yeah. it happens at the at the in the way which you know the person the person going through it is able to, to deal with it um yeah i agree i think maybe sometimes there's a tendency to sort of oversimplify it for when you when you're looking at it from someone else's perspective and and and, and just oversimplify that you know oh you know is it not just as simple as you stop believing in God, you know, yeah. and, um, and it's, um, but in reality, it's not like that. It, it's, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more complicated yeah. and uh, there's a, there's a lot of different facets to it. I think, um, and often it, it can be quite like, um, it can be quite difficult to talk about, which I think why often maybe that, um, for for me anyway, I think um, I there's a big there's a big sort of fear in my my mind of like kind of being misunderstood, mm. um, which is sort of made worse by the fact that I didn't really know how to communicate what I was going through um, to people that weren't going through it. <laughs> so and then what that brings is that you you often like sort of create this fantasy in your head that. Um, people maybe are judging you a certain way, thinking a certain thing about you, when in reality, they might not even be thinking that at all. Yeah. But, but you've sort of created this yeah. whole reality in your head that, um, that you've convinced yourself is, is how they are, you know? Yeah. And, then, and then you see that world through that perspective. So then everything you like reinforces, that reinforces that worldview or reinforces that, um, that opinion. You sort of yeah. see, and I, th I think looking back, like, looking back on it I, could, I probably made it a lot harder than it could have had to be yeah you know and because yeah. i i did a lot of that where I sort of um read or I, I i decided what people were thinking about me rather than yeah. just letting them communicate that you know yeah yeah because I mean, that's what we do we, we we've we know who we are um yeah. and i think this is part of being part of this kind of like a herd or a group is that what i know when I was in that place, I'd have been a bit of a dick to you. I'd have just said, oh, you probably lost it. You just don't care. You know, I, I, I know what I would have been like. And then suddenly I just make every person in that group exactly what I was like. Now, it's probably true for some people, and it's probably fair in some areas. But on the whole, like nobody else in that group is me. Um, yeah, and actually... Exactly, yeah. Um, and that can work positively and negatively, right? So maybe you were an amazing person and you wouldn't have been very judgmental. And then you go into the group and everyone turns out to be really judgmental and you're like, oh crap, I didn't see that coming because I thought everyone would have been like how I would have done it. Um, yeah. So it works in both ways, but I think we cause ourselves a lot of pain by creating these little worlds um, you know, of assumptions of, oh yeah, yeah. Steve's going to think that about me. Bob's going to think that about me. Oh, Julie, she's definitely going to think this. And actually, we've never talked to Steve, Bob, or Julie at all about this. And actually, nine times out of 10, they don't even think about us, right? I mean, like, what? Like, just some random other person. I mean, yeah, maybe they know us fairly well, but like, they're obsessed with their own worlds, right? And dealing with their own stuff and probably worried about what Ben thinks of them or, you know? Um, and so, like, we get so fixated and we make the whole world revolve around, oh, they're all probably obsessing about me and my terrible choices. and. 
a lot of the time that just isn't the case. And, it, and I'm not trying to minimize that it is the case sometimes. I've, I've seen a lot of people go through some very painful processes of how churches have responded to them going through this and things like that. Um, but I definitely think there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity when we don't communicate and we don't engage with the people around us and instead we live in our heads that we can make it really bad for ourselves and actually nothing's actually real yet you know we're just living in this fantasy um so yeah no it's it's really true yeah i think um yeah one thing i I was just thinking about when you were speaking then was um the the lyrics in the song where i talk about um i'm uh, i think there's a lyric which is like i'm cynical and tired of all the things uh we uh What's the all the f- oh, sorry the lyrics i'm cynical and tired from all the focus on the things we can't see hear feel or describe oh yeah so kind of that was I missed at the beginning of that but yeah <laughs> yeah so th- the idea with that was kind of about the process of kind of feeling a little bit like what i'm experiencing christianity to be doesn't really translate into the real world so there's a lot of focus about like these like things which we can't really see. So for instance, practically what I'm speaking about is like there's a big emphasis in like you know interceding um, and praying and doing a lot of like um, and talking about things like you know spiritual entities and and all these sort of things that are very Christian terms and and but it's like I was just being like why why I just was sort of thinking why am I wasting so much time or why are we wasting so much time thinking about these things when like we could be getting on with our lives like that we know to be true right here you know yeah and and like um I just sort of became a bit disillusioned with and that's one of the things which sort of I really like when I was listening to Rhett and Link's podcast about their journey because Rhett, Rhett was saying you know since um since his faith has deconstructed like that's the reason he gets up every morning and does 20 minutes of back exercises <laughs> because because he's he doesn't know what's going to happen after he dies but what he does know is that he has <laughs> this life right now yeah you know I mean? so maybe get so make the most of it. <laughs> yeah and and he's and, he, and, he, and it's it really interesting like uh, like how that the focus on like living life well right now often like taking your eyes off like those sort of things that like a sort of can really help you sort of refocus like there's a parable that that pete rollins tells about he says there's um there's a there's a he says this like parable that he made up and he says it's like a there's a vicar or a priest that has this spiritual gift that every time he prays for someone um they stop believing in God. <laughs> so it's like, like Ben. <laughs> yeah. So um, so he spends. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's about you. Um, you should invite him on to your podcast, mate. Uh, he'd be. Oh, really I'd cool. love to have Pete Rollins. Yeah, I mean, too. Um, me but here, uh, and he's so this bit. So this priest spends all this time avoiding trying to pray for people because he thinks if I pray for people, then they'll stop believing in God, and then um, eventually. Uh, one time, I'm probably butchering this story, but <laughs> this, <laughs> <laughs> this is how I We'll have him tell and, the other version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he and then he meets the, he meets this guy on the on the train, and he notices the the, the guy in the train um is like speaking really angrily on the phone to um his colleagues, and he's like um looking really stressed and and like he's like a bit overweight and he just doesn't look that healthy and he's like really stressed and everything. And then, and, and he, and he notices the priest that wearing his, um, you know, priest uniform, whatever that is. And he's like, um, and basically they get chatting and the, and the guy asks him to pray for him. And, uh, and the priest's like, no, no, you don't want me to pray for you. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, can you pray for me? So he ends up praying for him and then they go their separate ways. The next day, the guy wakes up and, and he completely um, loses his, he's lost his faith in God. And um, and, the, and the result of that is that he sort of stops going to church. Um, he stops um, engaging with his faith in that way. And, and he ends up having to spend more time with his, with his family and end up more time like in, engaging with like, um, and because he's got um, less time, 
to like go to church and stuff and and, and be part of that community um he he realizes that he doesn't really enjoy his job at all so he quits his job and he and he does and he starts you know doing what he loves and stuff like that and uh and then and then they bump into he bumps into the priest one time and he and he says like the priest is like how are you doing he goes off since you prayed for me you helped me find my faith mm. and the idea being that like he he found what was um life was about really you know through that yeah. and and it took him to sort of put down what he thought what he thought belief in god was um in order to sort of find that actually like this is what kind of faith this is what um believe yeah i'm doing a terrible job at this no it's good I, you I, understand what I, for sure yeah yeah, yeah. no yeah I, I think i feel like um i didn't do a great job explaining <laughs> the story but but um it's yeah it's in it's in a book called um the uh, orthodox it, heretic. heretic yeah that's right yeah by yeah. people so he's got loads of loads of st- little stories like they're only like yeah. a few pages long like that's sort of uh, just trying to make you think and re reevaluate stuff it's so good maybe it's, yeah it's powerful though the thought that um and i think this is what many people that deconstruct are able to then go on and experience um and again it's really hard to put this into words in a way that um someone that hasn't gone through this process and is still very much a, a com- content committed uh you know christian uh they're gonna be like what are you talking about you can't put down god to find your faith you can't yeah. you know stop going to church and then really find out what life's about and like these are the things that life is about you know you can't you can't let go of these things um this is yeah. really hard to put that into words but i think there's an experiencing of it there's a walking through of it that that um that this is this is so much I'm, I'm getting so much more out of life I'm, I'm eking out of life every second of the day rather than just waiting for the next time to have the spiritual moment the whether it's a church service or it's a prayer time or it's quite you know quiet time at the beginning of the day those moments that are hallowed and spiritual and good and uh, they're they're the moments that kind of keep us going but actually when you put those down you suddenly realize oh i've got to find some purpose and meaning in anything i can find around me and you quickly find out that there's purpose and meaning in everything around you yeah um and and it's a very uh it's a very exciting and beautiful journey. it's scary initially for sure very yeah. scary um but it can become uh exciting the more that you start to kind of peel the layers away and um yeah i think i think it's scary though it's scary freeing yeah. that that you know caged up tamed horse you know fenced in it's, it's scary to let them go you you don't want yeah. that to happen you and uh, you want to stay in the bounds of safety and certainty and knowing what's what what's next um yeah. uh it's, it's nice to have that um it is and you don't know where a wild horse is going to run you don't know where that that next bend of the stream will take you yeah. um it, it's, it's a very uncertain kind of process uh, for sure yeah, no, it's yeah. really interesting. I'm trying to think if there's anything else in this song we should talk about. Um, I think we're good. There's a couple of things that I saw in this, that actually, I think we talked about before uh, we started the song, things about like our language and how we say things, how we, how we communicate as well. Uh, I think um, jumped out at me in this song, but let's yeah. listen to the next one as well, because I think we're only going to do three. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think which one should, should we do? Should, should, um, Grace and Gravity? Yeah, let's do that one for oh, sure. Yeah. Forest fire Burn the trees As west wind Traveling across The seas Take your time Westward breeze Oh, turquoise water and golden stream For I know the shadow comes from the sun The rain makes the river run I have heard, I have seen Forest fires burning me Where it comes from it must lead and gravity
The rain makes the river run I have heard, I have seen Forest fires burn in me Where it comes from it must leave Oh grace and gravity <laughs> I really, really love it. Right, talk to Oops. me about this song because I feel like there's. Uh... Yeah, talk to me about this song. Hit, hit me with the. Uh, where does this song come from? <laughs> this song is kind of um, the original idea for this song was was um, was a. Uh, I heard the phrase "grace and gravity," which was on a. I think it was a podcast or something. I was I heard the phrase grace and gravity. I think it might have been a Rob Bell podcast or something. And I just thought that is such a cool um just sounds good, doesn't it? Grace and gravity. Mm. I just like the way the words sounded to go. And um and uh, and and the whole the whole idea for me is that um they sort of represent two sides of life. You've got the grace, which is like the idea that, you know, it's a it's a miracle we're even here anyway, you know? Mm. Um, and, and like the, the sort of magic that we even get to experience life. And then yeah. there's the, there's a flip side, like the tragedy of life, like the suffering, the, the, the times which we find difficult and, and like, um, which aren't, which aren't so nice, you know? And, uh, that's the, that's the gravity, like the everyday, the mundane, the, the hard you know and and the idea that we need both those both those realities in order to grow yeah you know we need both those things in order to um sort of move forward and mm. and sort of experience like the the sort of the paradox he kind of it, what i've experienced is like in order to gain sort of empathy and compassion the often the way that you get that is to, is to go through suffering because yeah. then you you're fully able to identify with um with uh, other people you know i'm just yeah, opening no. up the lyrics yeah okay no absolutely yeah no i mean like that's that's certainly my experience and I, cer- I know it's a lot of other people's experience it might be just anecdotal but it's certainly a very common anecdote is that yeah. um people people experience tremendous growth and change um under um external stress uh, you know it might yeah. be the death of a loved one it might be a divorce it might be um it, you yeah. know whatever it is getting sick you know or just losing your job or you know something that's maybe you know a, like, less even tragic but like a, ba- a bad breakup or something it's like yeah it's like i i think um this this there's something about going through going through something like that that changes you in a way that nothing else can and, and often um provokes like a deep sense of sort of love for, for other people like, like and i really uh, i'm learning a lot from one of my friends at the moment um is that recently um lost his lost his wife um mm. and and he uh, about and she she passed away a few months ago about eight or nine months ago and, and i was chatting to him and he was saying that you know now since since it, since he's been grieving he has such a deep sense of like um compassion and the thing the things which used to bother him 
no longer bother him. So, yeah. like, for instance, you know, maybe his neighbours are playing music really loudly and he used to be, like, really frustrated and, like, go around knocking the door, ask them to shut up and stuff. But now um, it's more, he's, he makes him think, you know, why why are you playing music at like this time in the morning like what 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 are you trying to what are you trying to drown out like what thought yeah. why why are you so like struggling to sleep that you have to play music and and actually feeling like a, an empathy for them you know and like you know if you see someone that's like looking down you he starts thinking you know you know what have you been through that's making you um making you look like this this miserable you know and sort of because he's sort of been to the depths of despair so he can he can understand how low people can get and be able to relate with that yeah. and i think that was sort of the idea with the song about these two these two um two I don't, these two sort of realities yeah so you know cuz i know for me like that's that's something i can engage with so much i'm i'm not very um easily sorry easily in touch with my emotions uh, it's something i quite yeah. i struggle with a lot um, but I do know that going through some of the harder things in life has certainly helped me empathize with people that go through similar things. So uh, going through a very uh, painful and, and, and traumatic for me in many ways, uh, divorce helped me see that how I talk to people that got divorced before that, you know, I hear someone's getting divorced and I'm like, Oh, I'm really sorry for you. That, that, that is, that sounds terrible. I'm really sorry yeah. for you. But now when I hear someone gets divorced, I'm like, Oh dang, I know what that feels like you know it's yeah. not it's not intellectually oh that's yeah. terrible i'm really and sorry you've instantly for you. got that connection it's you like, know, where, oh yeah. i remember what it feels like to be have your heart ripped out to be gut punched you know to just be wallowing for months on end going, and then, God, yeah, why and me you know how it like, feels to like sort of bl you can you sort of put yourself in the the you can you know you, you can see them maybe like blaming themselves for what they could have yeah. done differently and you can really relate with that you know it's absolutely and and also as you come in to try and be there for them to encourage them to support them you also remember how much of what people that don't know what this is like that can empathize with this how much of their um their offers for help made you want to punch them in the face <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know I mean? all the people that came to me going oh phil don't worry you'll marry someone else one day i'm like what, why would you say this? Like, why, why yeah. would you say this right yeah. now to me when I'm literally in the midst of my despair? Um, yeah. And it's true. Yeah, probably I will meet someone else later. Yeah, it doesn't. I'm not saying what you're saying isn't true, but it's not very helpful right now. And so, yeah. just knowing that suddenly, when I'm going through, when I've been through that, I can now come alongside someone. And go, just being able I know to, like, what's yeah, not, not, not necessarily. You know, yeah, exactly, yeah, absolutely. And knowing, knowing what you don't need to, you don't need to have an answer. You know. Yeah. It's just like, it, it, it is that perspective that you're talking about as well. You know, I know when my, my mom died, um, like, man, that grounded me some serious amounts. Like, and, and I still talk about it. It's probably one of the most beautiful moments of my life um, was like being with my mom in the, in the few days that uh, it took for her to die, where we didn't get to talk. We didn't get to connect uh, in, in what most people consider to be a meaningful process or, or way because she was, just in so much pain she was completely out of it on drugs and things like that and largely yeah. in and out of consciousness and yet to me that was one of the most beautiful and important periods of my life and people go how can you say that how can you how can you do that and i know like other people my family would be appalled by me <laughs> saying that in some ways because they, they don't see it that way but for me i'm like no this actually was one of the most grounding um experiences i've ever had that that granted me so much in this world but also granted me so much in what i would consider to be the spiritual uh and the spirit um and it was probably one of the most significant moments where those those points crossed over and i'd say the same actually of going through a divorce or some so of the how, other how, painful parts yeah. how exactly um was that then like and in, in, in how did it um link sort of connect you to the spiritual in that sense i think there was an element of it forced me to go in it forced me to 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 engage with well, well, what is happening here who are we what are humans what are what are these emotions i'm feeling why do i feel so emotional what what and realizing oh my gosh my relationships with people are so key and so important and i've always been very close to my mom but realizing wow like 
that's gone. Those things that I love and value, that they can be like that, they can be gone. And actually, yeah. in a sense, that's what makes them precious mm. is that they are yeah. a grace. There is a beautiful gift. Like, you know, the fact that I'm a friends with you is a, is a remarkable, it's a fluke, right? At the end of the day, yeah. I mean, it, obviously, uh, you know, you, some people say, wow, it's you know, God's providence and he moved everything around just right that we meet and become friends. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a miracle that your parents had sex the night they did, right? Yeah, your mum could have been like, uh, "Not today, Mister Hughes. Uh, it's been a long day. Let's have sex tomorrow." <laughs> and when they, because it would have been a different, um, it would have been different set of variables. It would be a completely different child, and you would have been born a day later. You might have had different experiences. Your birthdays yeah. would be different. Your school might be slightly different. Everything different, and we never would have met. Or if we did met, meet, we'd be like, eh, "I don't really like that guy." You know, like, it's a miracle that this existence that is ben exists and it's a miracle that i've come across this ben and now have yeah. a relationship like I, I feel like there's a a reality of like holy crap what are the odds that, that i yeah. mean the, the odds that i exist or i think it's about is it like 30 trillion to one or something it's, it's there's, like there's a street, street. Um, there's a famous but, yeah. street there's a there's a good the street song um they have a song which is like um, every single uh, person on your mum and dad's side for billions of years passed on their genes. Yeah. Um, what are the chances of that? It's, 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 yeah. it's unbelievable, course. right? It's, it's um, the fact that you are you is, is astonishing. It's, it's a miracle in, yeah. in every single uh, sense of the word. Um, and I think it's just, it grounded me in a lot of these things of just realizing, man, life is beautiful. Life is meaningful. I don't think, I think that was the first, I've, I've had, um, my, some of my grandparents have died, but I wasn't very close to them. Um, and I've known people that have mm. died, but, um, and I think maybe part of this is because I'm not very in touch with my emotions. Um, so I, I don't think I'd engaged with death in the same way that a lot of other people have by, yeah. by that point. But I think my mom, because we were so close and because we were um, very connected in that way, I think it grounded me in death and life in a way that I don't think anything else would have. Um, yeah. and, and I think... It's, it's, it just means the world to me, you know, it, and my mom still means the world to me. And I still, um, I still feel very close to my mom. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think, I think that tragedy taught me something. I'm not sure I would have been able to learn easily any other way, maybe in another tragedy, yeah. maybe in someone else dying, but I don't know if I could learn some of those key things that have made me yeah. the person I am today without having experienced the loss of, a, of someone I deeply love. Um, and I think there yeah. is that element, you know, it's, it's like what you're saying in the song, you know, the shadow comes from the sun, the, the, yeah. the rain makes the river run. You, you can't have rivers yeah. without a downpour at some point. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Uh, that's and the, end, the end lyric where I say, um, if you sift through the charred debris, you'll find grace and gravity. So um, just the idea that like, you know, after like, it's, it's very metaphorical, this song. So yeah. sorry about that if you don't engage with metaphors <laughs> well. But um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's sort of like um, the idea that after destruction or after something which is seemingly like a tragedy or uh, after suffering, there's so much grace to find, you know, in it. There's so much like um, growth to come from it um, that might not be apparent at the time, you know. Um, yeah. yeah no absolutely what do you so something that kind of jumps out at me in this is is the concept of um you talk about forest fires burning within you like what, what does that yeah. mean for you because because that's something that i'm like oh that's an interesting lyric for me it's like uh <laughs> to be honest at the time i was kind of like when i first sang it it was one of those things that came to me and i was just playing the piano and just uh, open for ideas and uh, i was just um for some reason, I just sang that lyric, and uh, I just thought that sounds quite cool. But then the more the more I sort of thought of thinking about it, it was just kind of the idea that um, you're constantly being renewed, you're constantly being like um, you're constantly taking things with you on on like a journey on the on um, through life that that might be beneficial and might be. Um, might not be you know yeah and the idea that kind of um through this process of sort of like refining um 
through this process of sort of like sort of evolving that that like yeah i'm not sure to, I don't know. It, it, no, no, it's it's interesting because I think the the thing of what I what what makes me think is, is I think of like these these concepts of something like forest fires. Sorry, how how bad are forest fires? We think of the fires that happened in Australia. We think of the fires that rage in California. And we're like, oh, these are terrible. But there's an yeah. element as well of um, they have to happen. It's a very natural process. Yeah. It's been happening for millions and millions of years, and it's actually a very consistent component of the ecosystem that requires these forest fires to kind of have these burnings so that things can regrow and grow more healthy and things like that. And, and I think we're constantly in these wars against what is, you know? Yeah. Um, you think of like the, um, I think of the last song where you're saying like, you know, well, why do these things happen? Oh, it's just because. Yeah, yeah just because that's the answer the answer isn't well like let me break it down for you in this da, 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 da. It, yeah. it just this is the way it operates you have to on some level accept that we need forest fires you have to on some level accept that if you want a sun you're gonna have to put up with some shadows if you want a river you're gonna have to have some rain sometimes right yeah you know yeah, like, yeah. it's just you have to allow that to happen and, and so for me like it, it i think the lyrics just like it hit me because um I think I am, I am, I struggle a lot with things not going my way. Um, I, I think I can be very, I can be very, I was talking about this in my last podcast with Andre. Uh, I, I need things to go my way. I can be a little bit autistic in that sense of, of just yeah. having everything lined up and I like things to be right. And when they don't go my way, I get really upset. Like I, I can mm. be really, really upset for like hours if yeah. a little thing doesn't go the right way. You know, yesterday I had like a, Full blown meltdown in some ways. I mean, it was, you know, I wasn't like wailing or tantruming or anything, but I was really just not good internally because the yeah. bins hadn't been picked up. They, they hadn't, they hadn't, they'd taken all the neighbors' bins, but not mine. And they come every yeah. two weeks. And I'm like, dude, how am I going to survive with no, like, I can't create any new trash because my, 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 my trash can is full. They're not coming for another two weeks. It's in the middle of a pandemic. I can't go take it to a skip or a trash dump or whatever. I'm like, crap and so i i let this like little thing to throw me so much i got really yeah. frustrated by it um and i'm like on the website online and i'm like i'm like where's the number i'll call someone and they can come and get no that they're not doing any call centers right now in the pandemic you can't call anyone oh well i can do it online no i won't let me log in because their login system's broken and i'm like i'm just getting more and more frustrated um and what's funny is is we get so wrapped up in in these uh these little things because at the end of the day this is a little thing it's just some trash, yeah. you know, I can, I can put it in a, a separate bag or something and put it to the side for now or whatever. And actually I ended up getting through to someone and they contacted me and they were like, Oh, really sorry. That happens. Happens occasionally. We've sent you some, like, uh, we'll send you some trash bags that you can like use and like, we'll pick them up even though we don't pick up excess. It's a special type of bag or whatever, and whatever. So I'm like, Oh, I had a big worry over nothing. Um, but the point was that we we have these little things all the time or big things that we're constantly warring with internally and it makes it 10 times worse for us right so like we were talking about the deconstruction thing like oh i'm making this 10 times worse for myself by assuming everyone's going to hate me because of this or everyone's mm. going to think i'm an idiot or everyone's going to think i don't take my faith seriously and we make this so bad for ourselves and actually we have to let it be what it is and actually we've got to maybe let some forest fires burn we've got to let some bad stuff happen We've got to let that do its work because if I allow it to take root and, and allow those to burn in me, I will come out with new life and, and something beautiful and I'll grow back even stronger and I'll create new uh, ecosystems. Or I mean, talk about if you don't like metaphors, what the hell am I even talking about, right? <laughs> you know, like all this new growth and life can come from these terrible tragedies. And I think um, like going back to my mom dying or something, like it's, I, I've seen people in my family struggle because they've not accepted what is they've had to create a narrative of something to be able to cope with it or they're not coping with it at all you know just different people in my life that knew my mom or whatever or family members and stuff and i think for me it's it's been in going no this is what is she, she died like can't really escape that one um yeah 
and I'm not going to try and create some magical narrative around it. I'm going to just engage with that truth. And through yeah. that, I've found a whole bunch of new life. Um, and so really that uh, it just, it grabbed me that concept of something yeah. so destructive, so um, yeah, negative I think, burning within. Cause for, like I said, for me, I think that lyric came and kind of, I just like the sound of it. I like, I like it just thought that sounds quite, <laughs> it sounds like it could be nice to fit it in the song. Yeah. And I think kind of the, the meaning sort of came a little bit after and it was kind of, yeah, ju just that whole idea of sort of embracing the, the, um, the pain, you know, embracing mm -hmm. the, the difficult times with the view that, you know, something better is coming along after basically, yeah. you know, and kind of, it is kind of, this 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 is one of those songs where it's kind of it's it's not as explicit as 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 say like silhouette. Um, although you know all the songs you know have quite a few metaphors in and stuff, but it's not as explicit as um, as silhouette. It's it's very it's very like metaphorical, and I think it can sort of for me like having like an like a really lit like sort of well um, understood meaning in the song maybe in this song in grace and gravity in particular isn't as important because it's sort of it's able to sort of the great thing with like metaphors is that people can sort of attract um, attribute meaning yeah. to them themselves yeah. um and and some, like some of my some of my favorite songwriters like half the time i don't really understand what they're saying. like yeah. for instance there's a, there's a really there's a songwriter called uh bon, bon iver uh yeah. bon iver uh, and he's um and a lot of his songs, um, you read the lyrics and it's sort of like, it's quite hard to like make sense of them, but, but they're fantastic songs and, and mm -hmm. they still, they still like, I still love the lyrics, you know, it's not mm -hmm. that I don't, that I think they're complete nonsense. It's just that they may be like, not as lit, they're not like as easy to, um, really make sense of at a first glance and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. You've got to dig deep. I like that though. That's that's what we're yeah. talking about. You know, that's, you you look at the Bible, you look at life. You've got to dig deep and find the meaning in it, rather than yeah. have it just laid out in front of you, just nice yeah. cookie cutter. Here's what life means. Here's what it all means. Here's yeah. here's the answers. Here's the black and white. Um, but last last thoughts on this one. Like I love I love this like little uh, segment in the in the second verse. I love for you to talk about this of because I think it it it. it talks a bit about what i was just talking about there of, of of how i pull from the forest i guess this is what this song most speaks to me about but but the the phrase endless dark deepest deep deep lend your wisdom come baptize me like talk to me what, what does that look like for you where does that come from when you talk about um because this is not christian language right christians do not go oh let the endless dark and the deepest deep just baptize me we're like no no get behind me satan you know it's like that's that's yeah, not yeah. um that's that doesn't feel like it's part of your uh past faith tradition as a such um it feels like there's, there's much more uh there's something new in that uh, in a sense that, that most christians probably wouldn't be engaging with in the same way uh, yeah. is that fair to say yeah i think so <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, the the um the whole idea with that is just like baptism it's like a an image of of like your new life in Christ, isn't it? That's what it like. You go under the water and you come up a new man, sort of thing, and mm. and being changed by that and identifying in the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what that's what baptism. Well, that's my understanding of it, and yeah. and like and the whole idea of like kind of this song is kind of about embracing the suffering, you know, embracing that you need to have both in order to grow you know mm. so the idea of like fully identifying in and allowing yourself to walk through that experience of like grief or suffering or you know or loss um and coming out the other side you know um that was kind of the idea of that lyric really and um yeah it some like there's a i mean i know um we read a book um recently um by richard raw the universal Christ. it's sort of a mm. um similar thing to what kind of he says in that book about about kind of how the main ways that we grow are from deep love and deep suffering you know? yeah they go hand in hand and that's how kind of 
so that's kind of the thought behind it dude we should wrap up because this has been yeah. amazing but uh i'm aware this is a long podcast so far <laughs> uh people can get used to this. this is what we're doing more and more of i like these long conversations because we get to go deep um, yeah. but people that want to check out so obviously we've, we've played some of your music there's plenty more uh, of that as well to, to find how can people connect with you check out your music you know if they want to message you are they, are they able to do that somehow like or yeah um, um, I guess um, the best way that you can check out my so my EP is, is actually called Grace and Gravity that's the title of the EP it's six songs so there's three more songs that you've not heard um, it's on you can listen to it on like all streaming platforms. It's on Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon Music. Um, if you want to sort of stay up to date with um, maybe coming to some of my gigs once or um, once everything's back to normal, um, you can follow <laughs> me on find me on Instagram at benhughes.music. And then there's a link there which you can follow. If you want to support me, you can buy my EP um, on my Bandcamp uh website awesome. but you can also buy an apple music and if you just search ben hughes and then grace and gravity you'll find my ep yeah now there is there's an imposter ben hughes isn't there there is another ben hughes yeah so you need to watch out right because like <laughs> there's, there's a know. few actually it's is weird it really? like oh man yeah, quite a few. <laughs> you didn't think you're going for like a, an, an artistic like you create some sort of cool name yeah i know? was i was um <laughs> i nearly did that but i was like i just can't think about it i'll just use ben hughes. <laughs> yeah. there's um it's yeah, such there's a big another... commitment coming up with a name right there's another musician called Ben Hughes, which is from like the, I think it's from like Brighton. Uh, he he's oh, also man, really he's good. British so as well. Yeah. Okay. So where is this now? You're playing some music as well. <laughs> he, he is like he's 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 really good as well. So you can give him a follow as well. Just make sure. Yeah. <laughs> double he, double he, down on making sure you got the right one. Follow them both. <laughs> yeah. He he's he's more of like an R and B style, you know, like uh, okay. a bit different a different style. But so I don't feel too um. You're not likely too to be jealous. too mixed up, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> awesome man dude thanks so much for coming on and doing this i really enjoyed it oh, i really it loved really it fun. thanks for inviting me so yeah no awesome well we'll maybe have you again that would be good we could uh we could yeah. certainly if you've got more songs we can uh look at them but just the chat has been really Definitely, fun yeah I hope people enjoy us chatting as much as we enjoy chatting <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know i can't imagine there's many people that got this far into it. if if you did then <laughs> yeah i know if you got this far if you got this far um you need to you need to like message me or ben and say you made it <laughs> if you got this far um, send me a message and I'll I'll, I'll um, give you a free copy of my EP. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Actually, wow. a backtrack on that. Back on that. <laughs> it'll, it'll give you a coupon to get like 50p off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not going to pay the bills. Not while you're on furlough, man. You need to be making all the money you can. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's what Boris is for. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool, man. Well, I love you, man. It's been really good. Yeah, I love you too, mate. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Awesome. See you later. Catch you later, yeah.